Okay, Olivia, it's yours. Hi, everybody. Welcome for this new Jenkins infrastructure meeting. Um, to, today, we are going to talk about the, um, the releases, a um, few change coming for the Jenkins releases. And we also have um, topics regarding um, Jira fixes, Jira configuration, the account app, and many other. So what I propose is we start directly for the Jenkins release. So today, we did a Jenkins weekly release. Um, most of the things were correct, accepted that we are having issues to build a Docker image um, for the latest version. We are currently investigating why. Um, so very brief, very quickly, we are running bats to run some tests on the Docker images. And for some reasons, um, the tests are not passing. Um, it's kind of the, it works on my machine, but in this case, it doesn't work. Uh, on the CI environment, so we are still investigating um, specifically for that. Any question? Anything to add? Hello. No. Hi, Tim. Um, the next topic also that I want to mention with the Jenkins release. So basically, it's specific. It's regarding the Azure file storage issue we had several weeks ago. Um, so Microsoft came back to me over the weekend to say. Um, basically nothing really new. Um, they explained that there is a limit on the number of files we can open at the same time. That limit is 2000. Um, I wasn't able, I mean, I'm, I, I cleaned up that, that, mean, that limit because they have instructions about cleaning that limits. So I have the feeling that they, they weren't able to identify the root cause of the issue right now. The thing is, at least for the moment, um, the Azure file storage has been working for th two weeks or three weeks. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, so what I'm going to do in short term, um, I'm going to, to roll back to that, yeah, to that um, systems. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably try to improve um, that in the future as well. I'll probably do that tomorrow. Um, I'll have some time to finish this. Um, I didn't want I didn't want to 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 merge the PRs related to that um, because I wanted to be sure that the release last week was um, was okay and weekly today as well. Um, but now we should be ready to um, to roll back everything to the previous situation. Uh, Olivier, good question regarding the Docker image issue. I mean, the Windows images are published, and the problem is just the Linux images, and that says command not found. Is that not straightforward? It is straightforward. We're, there is a PR open to resolve that. That's a, it's a typo by me. Uh, unfortunately, you can't. We don't test any of that part as part of the PR. So when a PR was merged to debug something else, um, it broke the release part. Um, but we're struggling to get the, the PR to fix it through the build system because all of the bats things are failing. I see. Okay. I just was, misunderstood what was the problem then. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we could force merge. I mean, the PR, the PR isn't actually going to be tested because it's a change to the published script and we don't run the published script as part of the PR. So well, you could just merge that PR. Wasting your, yeah, you're wasting your time then yeah. <laughs> if it's not testing it. We were just trying to understand whether something else had been introduced um, in a sort of inadvertently because everything was failing. Thanks for that explanation. Um, also, this remind me, um, we are now monitoring um, each time we do release, so each time we published a new version to the Maven repository, we have monitoring in place that detects if um, Debian, Red Hat, um, CUs, and Windows packages are available, but we are not monitoring if um, the Docker image are available. So that was the first step um, to be able to measure the fact that um, when we do release, we try to have um, that per, that moment very short between the moment we publish the release and the, the moment we generate the different artifacts. Um, we still have some on, ongoing work on that, which should come in the coming weeks. 
Um, if not a question, I'm going to move to the next question, to the next topic. Um, so we, we noticed that um, when we migrate the Jira to the Linux Foundation, uh, for some reason, the account app stopped creating users um, in Jira. So um, instead of relying on the account app to create the user, I made a few changes this morning. Um, basically, now, when someone tries to log in on Jira, if the user does not exist, it imports the user directly from um, LDAP. So it creates a new user locally on Jira from based on LDAP. Um, then we can modify the display name and the email from Jira. I mean, this is not ideal, obviously, but we just realized that multiple people were modifying the display name and the email. So for now, that's the current situation. Um, everything is back to normal now. So the good thing is we should be able to, to remove the account app to replace it by Kicklock. I still have to, to review the account app code to be sure that there are not other specificities done on the account app. Um, so one thing I just noticed, I, I realized that we discussed this yesterday when there was a problem. Um, this basically now means that the security team is in the situation where I always was against a user account migration because now there can be plugin maintainers that do not have a Jira account. Because the account only gets created on login. Um, and before they log in, if they track issues via GitHub and only ever log into our defectory to have upload permissions, I will not be able to ping them in Jira, which is a problem for me. Or, you know, the security team. Daniel, I'm not sure I'm capturing the, the con concept correctly. So there is a user account, but it only you use the Jira user account to ping someone with a security issue, but that right. Jira user account does not exist until the user has logged into Jira. Did I say yes. it correctly? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so that's the difference. So previously on the accounts app, when we, when we created a user, we automatically inject that user in the Jira database, which is not the case anymore um, in the current situation. So in this case, that's the Jira who import the user, but only when the user try to log in. So yeah, again, it's a limitation for, for Daniel. I don't have a, a good answer right now for that. Um, I'll try to. So should we, should we? The hosting user will have logged in. So whoever hosted it will have logged into Jira. Well, the, so yeah, the one, who's, the one who's campaign asking campaign. for the hosting request, but if you take over a dormant plugin, you may have never uh, accessed Jira, especially if you track issues through GitHub. So yeah, I, I acknowledge that it's not the default flow, but there is a valid, um, you know, ownership change and all of that is 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 something we do and we support it, and it's uh, it's what would allow someone to get into the situation to not be reachable via Jira. So ideally, we can there's webhook support perhaps in the beta account app or something like that, where we can keep operating a minimal sort of uh, account app. That, uh, that would create those accounts or per periodic uh, account sync or something along those lines. Um, in theory, I could create those accounts in Jira manually, but that's so incredibly annoying that um, I would really prefer we had a different, different solution here. So I'm the, um, I'm checking right now. Um, I, I, I think I, know, I, don't think we need, I don't think we need to go into more de uh, details here. I only brought it up because you were saying, yeah, we don't need the account app anymore, and I didn't yep. want to leave that uncommented for the for the uh, minutes. Okay, no, no, that, that's a good that's a good remark. Um, I'm going to check if um, the LDAP configuration doesn't allow me to to synchronize user on a regular basis. Um, like, let's say once a, once a day or something like that. Those are differently, okay, good to know. 
Ok, thanks, thanks Daniel for your input. Um, yeah, thanks. I put to the agenda the next topic, which is Windows Windows Docker image, but I don't think um, anything changed on that topic. Garrett, will you confirm? Uh, no, that that PR is merged now, so we should. Okay. And um, it, they they are very available for the new release that just came out. Okay. Those one those okay. ones worked. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, before we talk about CI Jenkins I also want to, to remind people that I deploy a service named status.jenkins.io. So the idea of the service is just to provide feedback to the people. So it works in two ways. The first one is we just write a markdown that we publish in a Git repository. And that markdown provides information about a coming maintenance, uh, a current issue or whatever. Um, the idea just to provide a central place where people could be notified about ongoing work. Then also, um, I started creating basic um, Datadog. So I, I insert Datadog um, HTTP check. Uh, so I just want to provide basic information if the service is really running or not. I mean, it does not mean that the service is running correctly. It just means that, um, yeah, just basic information. Right now, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, so that's a really good time to provide feedback on that service. Um, the only thing that I would like to work on it, if we decide to stick to it, is I would like to provide more um, basic monitoring. So, so provide um, monitoring for the other services. So right now, we only provide for get the Jenkins.io, updates the Jenkins.io, and package the Jenkins.io. Um, but yeah, just. Um, embedding more iframes any suggestions here a quick question i may have asked this before uh, isn't the usual approach to put a status page on a separate domain so that even dns issues uh, would not affect the status page i i know nothing about this but that seemed what the the motivation for someone of like I don't know, cloud, cloud B status, GitHub status, all of these. Yeah, that, 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 that could be a good practice, but especially in our case, we only have Jenkins.io and JenkinsCI.org. Um, and we have an Azure DNS for those two domains. I think we used to have more Jenkins domains, but um, I don't have access to them. So I think it's, it's kind of okay. Um, it, I think it's an acceptable solution to have it running on the same domain than Jenkins.io. Yeah, normally you have like a different domain registrar and everything is like a super thing because then your domain register grows out and you still got it, but I don't think we need it. We're just, we're just starting it. Okay, so, so it would basically would be overkill and I mean, we always have the Twitter account in the worst case, yeah. if everything it's else goes down. Now, but, but Azure the, DNS yeah. is out. There's huge issues. So it did it did go out earlier in the year too. So, so I was I, I I was expecting less actually data on the page. The status pages I'd seen had typically not included performance information. Olivia, can you share some insights? What what prompted you to want to put the status iframes inside there? So the reason why I put the iframe is because we don't have public monitoring. And the thing is, I regularly have requests from people saying, is it me or that website is down? Um, and so that, that, that was the motivation. So yeah, in this case, I'm just providing the information over the last week. So you can easily guess if something is wrong. So if you don't have any data since one day, let's say, you know that something wrong is happening since one day. And if the status page um, say, says that um, everything is up and running because nobody provided inform that, that, that information, everybody can open a PR and say, there is something wrong, let's say with a link to the, to the mailing list or to a link to any information that could be useful to, to the other people. So I did, I did some quick, um, experiment based on the Atlassian status page and uh, this one, CCC Estates. The, the Atlassian status page, um, we could have it part of the open source uh, sponsoring program. It's more advanced. Uh, we have better notification and so on, but it remain an application where you have to log in, provide a password, and only 
privileged people can modify the information. What I like with Sea Estate is that everybody can open a PR. Everybody can say um, there is something wrong with that service. Everybody can provide link to, let's say, Twitter, Reddit, or, or whatever the, the information you want to provide. And then other people can catch up. Uh, so it's not only the infrastructure team providing information if a service is up or not. Um, and providing the default monitoring to say, okay, that service is responding. Um, it's already a good information for the person who want to open a PR because yeah, if, the, if, the, if we don't have any response time, then, then something wrong is definitely happening. And if nobody is talking about that on the mailing list or on RSC, there is definitely something wrong. So that was a motivation. Um, I think it would be really useful if we also plan to notice in advance when we do maintenance. Um, so if you look right now on the status page, you see that I sent um, I sent a notification saying that we are going to update the communities cluster. This was a test. I think, for instance, the next time we do a communities cluster upgrade, um, even if even if we are not expecting any downtime, it could be useful to just notify people one week in advance to know that they may have, we may have issues. Um, so, so. so is this, I've typically on ci.jenkins.io just noted to the IRC channel Jenkins dash infra, is that a place where I'm upgrading plugins, I should publish something there, would you envision? Or is that, that that's, the likely that's, that's, lifetime that's, that's, of that outage so, is maybe a minute? So yeah, the thing is, there are two things. The first one is you can, if you know that the maintenance window will be, let's say one hour, you can open a ticket, you can publish that, that markdown fine, and you can say there is a Windows maintenance and the service will be done for one hour. So you don't have to, to, to eject more information once your maintenance windows is done. I'm not sure if we have to create an incident uh, when the service is done for a few minutes, but if we know that the service will be done for let's say 20 or 30 minutes, um, maybe that would be nice to add um, the information there. And I think when we do, let's say a CI Jenkins IDU version update, that would be useful to put information there. Um, because I think last week I saw people asking if the service was done or just maintenance. Um, it was just the maintenance, but yeah, I think it could be useful for the people. Um, I, I just wanted to add, I really like the graphs because uh, an experience that I had several times over the last few months with um, GitHub is I'm basically on GitHub all day and something starts feeling broken, slow or not right. And I look at on GitHub status and there's nothing. And I look at GitHub status 10 minutes later and I noticed 10 minutes before they did. <coughs> yeah, that, that's so why you like having having me basic to, information. Yeah. yeah, so the graphs giving me a live insight without someone having to create an incident might be useful, especially for a for our environment, which is not quite as monitored as I'm sure GitHub.com is. Okay, thanks. Um, I propose to move to another topic. Um, so I want I want to to uh, to say that we are starting to investigate how we can um, improve the stability of CI.Jenkins.io, and we are looking at ways to run CI.Jenkins.io to Kubernetes. So in order to move uh, most of the agents on Kubernetes. Um, this would be a quite major refactoring um, because right now we both use containers and virtual machine running Docker, Docker login and the Jenkins file would not be compatible. So we are still at the beginning of the process to see how we can improve CI the Jenkins IO to be sure that it's reliable. Um, and yeah, we are we are trying to identify the different uh, the different areas that need to be improved. Um, we really would like to see like um, the, a best showcase about the best way to run Jenkins on Kubernetes, which is something that interests a lot of people today. Um, so yeah, if you're interested to provide feedback, um, this, this is a project that we are starting now. Any, any other? So yeah, there was just some information. 
if if it's okay, Paul, for you, I propose to move to the latest topic, which uh, yeah, which is sponsoring, so not not only Oracle. Um, I want so before we, we talk about the Oracle sponsoring, I had a look to the um, to, to the state of the infrastructure uh, sponsoring from AWS, and we are almost running out of credits. Um, so I think we still have one month in front of us. So. I would like to re-engage with Amazon folks to see if they are interested to continue the sponsoring or um, yeah, basically what was the current state there. Uh, th th does, it, does it correlate to the previous topic? I mean, if we start moving some workload of CI Jenkins IO on EKS. This, 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 this could be related to the previous topic, yeah. That's why I want to bring this here. Oh, but, but actually, isn't it, isn't a move to Kubernetes a good thing? Because if we needed to move to some other hosting, to Google or to, to IBM Cloud or Oracle, whoever donates to us, Kubernetes is likely much more portable than our current, than our current Azure-based infrastructure, right? So, so for me, it feels like Kubernetes is a good thing, no matter whether we stay with AWS or not. So yeah, so you're right, you're right. But what I want to um, to add to to Damien's um, concern, the reason the reason why we decided also yeah to move to Kubernetes was to have a better portability. Uh, right now, each time we I mean we move from Azure to Amazon, we move from Amazon to Azure, Azure to Amazon, and so we had um, compatibility issues, and it forced us to 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 fix small issues. The idea here is would be to use Kubernetes agents. So wherever we run the service, it's fine. The, the main difference is one of the limitation until today is um, to use Amazon to run Kubernetes was the Amazon is still owned by CloudBees. So only CloudBees employees could, can work on it. So they, Damien started deploying a Kubernetes cluster on Amazon. So we could provide the Amazon cluster and then we could um, work on CI and Jenkins.io the same way we are managing the other services. So uh, using Helm charts. If we don't have um, sponsoring uh, on Amazon, we may have to look for other solutions for the infrastructure. I mean, for, for, for where we run the Kubernetes cluster, but the work to run Jenkins on Kubernetes, to the work to identify how we monitor efficiently CI.Jenkins.io how we run, how we, we write a Jenkins file to run on Kubernetes that I have, um, the, the, sorry, the, the Jenkins file on Kubernetes or Kubernetes um, is still relevant anyway, um, because if tomorrow we have to move to another cloud provider, I mean, everybody's providing Kubernetes, um, that manage Kubernetes clusters. Um, so we just, yeah, that would be a good way to be portable. In, in a kind of related note, um, has anyone looked at the, the kind of Docker deprecation from Kubernetes and the potential impact that that might have for us? Yes, um, to, be, to be quite honest, there is nothing to worry about, at least for the use case of agents running on Kubernetes. The reason is it's because uh, the deprecation is not about Docker, but about a wrapper between the Kubernetes agent named the kubelet and the Docker engine, which is container D. And in the middle, there were a wrapper named Docker shim created so to sounds, ensure that it's Creo. So Damien, we lost you. Oh. No, no, no I heard, I heard yeah, you yeah, just fine. So okay. Damien, you said low risk because? Because in fact, uh, it's, it's only, um, let's say, black box how Kubernetes interact with the container engine. The container engine, by default, is container D, which is the same as Docker. The thing is that Docker is kind of monolith with a lot of features, and Kubernetes is only using the container D part. And what has been deprecated is that they don't use the Docker shim wrapper that we used until this latest release. So by default, if we use pod and we deploy Kubernetes as we used to work, there should be no concern on that part. However, the risk could lie on how do we use Docker in Docker or Docker on Docker. So as soon as we have, we need the Docker engine to run a Docker run command or Docker build command as part of a whatever build. In that case, depending on what we want to do, it might be an issue. 
However, I will say this will be tackled down by the security part because Kubernetes is theoretically able to run Docker engine as rootless container. So that will be basically part of defining a Jenkins file that say, on that pod, I have a container with a Docker engine, which is only mine, no shared dependency. And if we can ensure that this run with the security concern we could have on such a cluster, then we don't have to care about the outer container engine, which is managed by Kubernetes without us knowing anything. I mean, I, I am confident okay, I did make, not make capture it. adequately. Okay. So it, it makes CI more complicated. We're, we, we're using it for CI. Um, so it's things like services that use things like test containers um, and want to spin up like integration test databases and that sort of thing. Um, so I don't think it would affect us directly. I don't know of any places right now isn't in the current state where we mount the Docker socket, but it's, it certainly affects people who use Jenkins um, as a CI service and runs their jobs in pods um, because it's fairly common to mount the Docker socket um, so that you can run at least test containers, if not other things. Yeah, the, the, the thing is that it's really risky uh, in terms of uh, Mounting the Docker socket is something risky. So Especially we should, in a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. Basically, you have access to the Docker socket. You are super user of the underlying host. Unless that Docker socket is restricted with, uh, with a containerized and isolated Docker engine, which run as rootless. But this depends on the kernel of the host you are running in order to to have Docker inside Docker nested containerization with the right level of isolation. That's why most of the time the CI pattern is when you need such case like running test container that will run Docker run and stuff, you need a virtual machine for your workload to be sure that you have a one site agent. This might be something we, we're gonna hit, uh, but we need to investigate on that part. No, no concern for the current status of Kubernetes that we're using related to the Docker depreciation. We still have two releases of Kubernetes before anything will be changed by default. The next 1.20 will take three months to be available on both AKS or GKE or uh, AKS. And it will only print warnings on the logs, depreciation warning. A AKS has moved from 1.19 already. So it's, yeah. it's already, I mean, we're not using 119 yet, but it is TA. I think, I believe it's TA on APS. And they've already moved to using container D and not using Docker. So while that's upstream- the, That's the same, not, with, the same with GKE as well. Yeah. Um, and on, and on, our OKS, on our OKS cluster, we are still running on 1.17, so yeah. Yeah, I, I think IBM did it a year or two ago as well. But, um, so it's, I mean, upstream's kind of behind the cloud. I mean, upstream is just killing anyone left over, I guess. Most of the cloud vendors have already moved away from that. Um, I just propose to we stay focused to the, um, because we are almost running late. So we are, I mean, we are running late now. So what I propose is to quickly cover the last topic, which is about sponsoring our, uh, by Oracle. Um, Mark, do you have some inputs here? Uh, just to note that Oracle offers a two year, two year, 75% discount for their for their resources as part of a thing called uh, Oracle for startups and they've offered it to the Jenkins project uh, at least they've expressed willingness to consider it uh, I've sent a message to the info mailing list I think it just is a place to discuss it further there I'm doing some experiments with Oracle cloud right now in my personal time trying to see what would it mean how would it interact etc um, it's just, it's a cost saving. Yeah. While we're also talking about sponsoring, um, there is something that I forgot. We are paying for the Jenkins Infra Project uh, GitHub uh, accounts. So it's something like $300 per year. And now GitHub changed several months ago uh, to provide um, 
up to 10 private Git repositories. So we could switch to the free plan now. I don't know if you have an input there. Maybe I should contact GitHub support. I know that um, we'll have to pay, I mean, by the end of the month. So I just want to be sure that um, there well, is nothing. The other thing is that we're on a legacy know. plan as, as well. And yeah. it means we don't have access to everything. I think we don't have things like triage permission and other things because those are only available in new plans. Okay. Um, it says unlimited, so free is unlimited public or private repositories. I think we have unlimited. Oh, no, uh, yes, free. I thought it was 10, sorry. Yeah, so the only thing, so on free, we miss out on code owners, which we do use. Uh, Daniel, do you have any information regarding the Jenkins CI um, organization? I don't know if you are limited to one organization because I'm pretty sure that the Jenkins CI organization is sponsored by GitHub. Uh, the, Jenkin, the Jenkins CI organization is a free uh, okay. organization. We have no private repos there. It's completely open source. However, okay. the uh, Jenkins CI third organization has a sponsorship that Tyler organized. Um, we currently have like 300 private repositories there. Um, and uh, it, it, we basically have a 100% off forever coupon, but I, I, I'm a bit hesitant to change the plan and everything in case that uh, vanishes. Okay. Yeah, I understand. I, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's just Jenkins Infra is the one, I guess, we we're paying some money for. We don't, we don't use code owners very much there, but we use it on things like the Jenkins IO repo for the governance stuff. Um, and right. like Kubernetes, we use it. It's mostly for automatically requesting reviews. No, but, yeah, but on uh, Jenkins uh, IO, it really is used to control to control access, right? You can't approve a change to the governance documents unless you're a code owner of governance. Yeah, I was just saying that if you on the free plan, it doesn't look like you have code owners. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I'll investigate. Like so hundred dollars a year or whatever. We'll all we ask about sponsoring for it. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, I propose to, to close the meeting here. Um, we are already four minutes um, after the line. So I propose to continue the discussion on RSC um, and on the mailing list. Thank you for your time and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.